I'm nominating Jerome Powell for a second term as chair of the Federal Reserve. And I'm, non I'm, nom I'm nominating Lael Brainerd to take the position as vice chair. Today, the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years, carrying the promise of a return to maximum employment. It means supporting a growing economy that includes everyone. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair for a second term and elevates Lael Brainard to number two. Biden's continuity call makes Fed hike bets intensify markets price in a full quarter point rate rise into the June meeting. And we discuss, of course, all of this inflation expectations and pressures in our exclusive interview with the ECB's Klaus Knot. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go, but it'll be a good conversation, of course, on some of these COVID lockdowns and what we can expect on growth. We also had some PMI numbers today. Overall, a little bit better than expected, so maybe it adds a little bit of pressure, certainly on policymakers to do something when it comes to tapering. The European stocks, 600. You can see uh, down some 1.3 tenths of 8%. The focus there, not only on uh, the, you know, the, the inflationary bets actually spurring a lot of the central banks to do more, but the focus certainly across the board and what we heard in terms of the economic impact of renewed lockdowns. Then the other story is, of course, the price of oil, which we'll get to in a second. Um, oil very much in focus as we expect countries from India to the U.S. to possibly release some of their strategic reserves as soon as today. And then we we're just talking about Turkish lira, the weakest ever beyond 12, currently at 12, 2379. This is on the back of uh, President Erdogan giving a speech yesterday. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. UK-based Atom Bank is moving to a four-day working week, one of the most dramatic flexible working policies introduced by a finance firm since the pandemic changed office norms. The fintech, which has four 130 employees says contractual working hours will be reduced by three and a half hours to 34 hours per week with no change in salary. Now the UK government is to temporarily take over the running of the gas and electricity supplier bulb as the energy crunch deepens. Regulator Ofgem will ensure uninterrupted supplies to bulbs 1.7 million customers by appointing a special administrator with costs supported by by the government. Soaring energy prices have caused 21 suppliers to collapse since August. And Samsung Electronics is reportedly planning to build a $17 billion chip-making plant in the Texas city of Taylor, about 30 miles from its existing factory in Austin. The new facility could create around 1,800 jobs, with chip output expected to start by the end of 2024. And that's your Bloomberg business flash Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel says there is an increasing threat of inflation taking hold. The central bank official reckons that the resurgent pandemic will not derail the recovery, while her remarks follow months of global investor concern at inflation and precede euro area inflation due out next week. Well, joining us now for an exclusive conversation on monetary policy, inflationary pressures and growth, I'm delighted to be joined by the Dutch central bank president. He is Klaas Knot. He's also a member of the ECB governing council. Knot holds the vice chair post at the Financial Stability Board, an international body that makes recommendations to regulators. From December 2nd, he would also take over at the SF FSB's chair. So, Klaas Knot, welcome to Bloomberg. I immensely enjoy our conversations, and I couldn't be more delighted that you're joining today. Uh, first of all, Mr. Knot, when you look at inflation expectations, good morning. When you look at some of the COVID lockdowns that we're seeing in part of Europe, does it actually change what you're forecasting on inflation and on growth? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty about sort of the size and the stringency of uh, the lockdowns that will uh, await us. And when it comes to the impact, I would say that while uh, it will surely have a moderating impact on economic activity, the impact of, on inflation will actually be more ambiguous um, because it might also reinforce some of the concerns we have about around uh, supply bottlenecks, which at the end of the day is one of the primary drivers of the current bout of unexpected inflation that we are uh, going through. So in a way, uh, the, the impact on, on inflation is much more uh, ambiguous. 
I don't think uh, myself that it will have an impact on our intention to wind down the uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. After all, uh, its dual objectives uh, have already been accomplished, both in terms of countering financial fragmentation as well as countering the damage that was done to the inflation outlook uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, if we look at today's inflation outlook, it's clearly more favorable than it was pre-corona in the sense that it is closer to our target than was the case pre-corona. But uh, Mr. Nort, and I understand that at the moment it's quite difficult to see the you know, impact on inflation given we also, also don't know how long these lockdowns will, will make and last. But does that mean that, you, you know, do you feel as strongly as you have in previous remarks about the upside pressures of inflation or could these you know, concerns also be tempered? No, I still feel as strongly about them. I, I, I should say that there is clearly elevated uncertainty when it comes to inflation and there are different scenarios uh, doing the rounds. Uh, if you look at uh, model-based uh, inflation projections, they still uh, uh, anticipate that inflation would fall back uh, below our 2% uh, objective in the medium term. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that these model-based projections have not served us particularly well during the uh, pandemic. They overestimated the initial impact, they underestimated the recovery, they underestimated the amount of uh, inflation that was associated with the recovery. And therefore, it's perhaps a little bit unsurprising that the market is actually pricing a different scenario where, yes, inflation will still come down. I mean, there is a, a consensus about that during 2022. But the market is pricing a scenario where the risks uh, in the medium term would be symmetrically centered around the 2% target. Well, if you have such an unusual gap, then uh, there is elevated uh, uncertainty. And I think that puts a premium on what I would call Call policy optionality, the fact that we shouldn't tie our hands for too long, but simply await the incoming inflation data and act uh, correspondingly. Uh, Mr. Knott, when you look at some of the market moves, do you worry that actually the market is too quick to react, that they fully price in things and then have to change quite quickly? Is it symptomatic of something that's happening in the markets? And how complicated is that for central banks? Well, we know that also uh, the market price pricing of inflation expectations has its uh, shortcomings. And one of the shortcomings is, of course, that it's very volatile and that it is responding uh, quite heftily to news, uh, etc. At the same time, uh, the market pricing of liftoff is is consistent with its pricing of inflation. So if their view of inflation is right, then probably their view of the liftoff is, uh, is also right. Personally, I have said before, I want to reiterate that, that I think uh, the conditions in our forward guidance for the liftoff will very unlikely be met in uh, 2022. I think the market has by now also understood that. Uh, it is pricing uh, the, the liftoff after 2022, and I think that is in line with our forward guidance. So what are you exactly expecting, or what does it mean for the ECB's decision in December? Well, in December, I think we have to come to an answer to the question, how far off our target are we really when it comes to uh, inflation? We all agree that inflation will come down. There are some objective factors uh, that will disappear from the inflation data after 12 months. So during 2022, we will see inflation coming down. The big question is, where will that trajectory take us? And there are different mm -hmm. answers to that question. And that's why I believe uh, we should, uh, in the post-PEP world, first come to the question, how much monetary accommodation do we really, really need? Well, if you compare the post-PEP inflation outlook to the pre-corona inflation outlook, it's clearly more favorable uh, than the pre-corona outlook. That, I think, is something uh, to take into, uh, into account. And that should also uh, be a measure for uh, the sort of recalibration of, uh, of asset purchases that we need to undertake in, uh, in uh, December. I would think that we need to come to an assessment on how far can we take our foot off the gas pedal mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. yet transferring our foot to the brake pedal. Right. D I mean, does it make a difference, actually, what the drivers of inflation are for the ECB reaction function, whether it's supply chains and it comes down, or is it, you know, when it hits that 2% that actually something needs to be done? Well, it makes a difference to the extent that we always look at inflation over the medium term. 
And if supply shocks are short-lived, then of course we have to look through them. The question, however, is are the supply shocks that we're currently seeing, are they truly short-lived? They are transitory, but I would argue that they're not necessarily uh, short-lived. And by the same token, they still translate into a loss of purchasing power of the citizens that we serve. Um, Mr. Knot, I also want to ask you a little bit about, you know, is some of the ideas that have been floated around in how to address some of the, you know, risk of market fragmentation after pet purchases come to a halt. What's your preference in this? Well, I would say that, first of all, yeah, the homogeneity of monetary transmission is dear to our hearts, and that is true for the entire governing council. And I would also say that flexibility within the PEP has served us quite well uh, in this context. But the PEP as a program will not end in March, only the net asset purchases will end. We will have a significant reinvestment challenge ahead of us, and we've already committed that we will reinvest at least until December 2023. And we will have to migrate that flexibility also to the reinvestment phase in order to prevent undue uh, fragmentation. And sequencing, and, and this, you know, you've reiterated a couple of times, sequencing is really important in the way that the market should be looking at this. Is the market doing a good job of interpreting the sequencing, or do you worry that sometimes it's a bit muddled up? No, I think we have been clear that uh, the sequencing will be that we uh, we are likely to terminate the net asset purchase phase of the PEP in March 2022. Then our next uh, instrument of marginal policy adjustment will be the APP. And as long as there is uh, inflation uncertainty around there, I think uh, that adjustment uh, should be possible uh, in either direction. And only after we have wound down also the APP, will rate hikes come into the equation? And I think the market understands that sequence of forward guidance uh, quite well. Uh, Mr. Knot, how does the Governing Council actually change with the stepping down of Mr. Weidmann of Germany? Well, we are guided by a mandate, and that mandate is price stability in the euro area. And that mandate, of course, is not dependent on, uh, on individuals. Um, at this moment, uh, I don't know who is going to succeed, Mr. Weidmann. No one, no one really knows. I just can say that I look forward to work with her or him in the same fashion that I always worked uh, and enjoyed working with Mr. Weidmann. Uh, Mr. Knot, you also become chair of the FSB in a couple of weeks. So what will you focus on? Is it you know, climate change and disclosure, or how worried are you about LIBOR? Well, the, the work program of the FSB is quite wide-ranging. Uh, obviously, we have a tale of work coming from the corona. We worry a little bit about the impact uh, that monetary policy normalization in the advanced economies might have on uh, emerging markets. We have roadmaps being laid out for us on issues like climate risk, on digitalization of financial services, on making international payments. Uh, more effective. Uh, we have to also take up our work again on cyber risks. So it's a wide ranging uh, workload, I would say. And on top of that, of course, are the vulnerabilities that emanate from the low for long uh, interest rate environment. I mean, we've had, uh, Mr. Knott, you know, a number of discussions with a lot of economists, and it's quite strange to see the difference in opinion from economists that are market participants about where we are in the economic cycle. Do you worry that actually, you know, we could be in a number of places just because of the unprecedented nature of what we're living through? Well, clearly, heterogeneity is an issue, and that is an issue across the globe when it comes to advanced versus emerging market economies. But it's even an issue within the euro area where you have countries like mine that are farther advanced in the cycle, and you have other countries that have not yet recovered uh, to the same uh, extent. That is why I have always publicly uh, endorsed and encouraged very much also the next generation EU recovery fund. And I think that's a, a, an appropriate instrument to also deal with this type of, uh, of heterogeneity within the euro area. Mr. Knort, as always, thank you so much for speaking to Bloomberg. That was the Dutch Central Bank President and ECB Governing Council member, Klaas Knort. Now, coming up, Jay Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair and elevates Leo Brainard to vice chair. We have that story next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Jay Powell is keeping his job. Joe Biden nominates the Fed chair for another four-year term. The U.S. president also elevated Lil Brainard to vice chair, maintaining consistency as the central bank grapples with rising inflation and the lingering economic impact of the pandemic. Well, joining us now is Kamaksha Trivedi, co-head of global effects and interest rates at Goldman Sachs International. Kamaksha, as always, thank you for joining us. There was a pretty swift repricing in a short amount of time. I think in one hour or so, repricing of the dollar and some of the treasuries, the yield curve actually being repriced. Are, are markets right to be so quick to change their view on some of the stubbish bet, or you know, are they getting ahead of themselves? Uh, thanks, Francine, for, for having me. So, look, I think that uh, it's clear that there was a perception that, uh, you know, a pick, a Brainard pick would be more dovish than, than a Powell pick. I think in the end, uh, I think these differences are somewhat overstated. Uh, and, and, you know, so you, you can understand the markets moving as they did. But I think there are some broader, um, you know, forces that are pushing the dollar, keeping the dollar on the front foot or pushing it higher over here. There's an active debate about, you know, when Asset purchases end in the uh, in the U.S. You know, you had other Fed speakers talk about that as well, uh, compared to a kind of the pushback against this sort of premature tightening that you know you be, we again heard from the ECB even 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 on your program. And so I think that that those underlying forces at the end of the day are more important. I think there's going to be a fair amount of consistency and continuity in policy, uh, obviously under under Chair yeah. Powell. But I don't think at the end of the day it would have been that different uh, under a potential Chair Brainard. I know, Chamak, you've also put, you know, your macro outlook for 2022 with some top 10 market themes that we should be looking at. When you look at, you know, what we can expect from the Fed, is it sequencing that you're looking at or actually, you know, the amount of which they start normalizing? I think the market debate is very much about the pace of normalization. Obviously, you know, they have, you know, already started tapering. Uh, you know, there's some discussion about the appropriate pace of tapering. Uh, but, you know, having just started or just having, you know, decided on tapering and having just started that process, I think the bar for kind of shifting that pace very rapidly, I would think, is, is pretty high. So I think the market debate uh, is, is, is really around the pace of hikes, sort of when they get going. Our expectation for now is, is a couple of hikes uh, next year in 22, instead of July and November. But it's probably fair to say that the risks to that are skewed to the upside. And that's really what the market is grappling with. That's you know, partly what's keeping, uh, keeping the dollar on the front foot here. Um, Kamaksha, and one of the actually in your top 10 market themes, it, you know, um, made me smile the way that you put something up, up the escalator. So you're looking at central banks. And again, that's sequencing. Uh, you talk about the Fed, but then pricing the unthinkable is when does the ECB start normalizing and actually move away from negative rates? What will be the, the you know, the one that could provide either a taper tantrum of some kind of market shock? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we've had a long period where, you know, rates have been very low, central banks have been extremely dovish, and this process of moving away from this sort of ultra-accommodative policy that has been placed, that has been placed, you know, pretty much across uh, across the, the, the world uh, is always going to be a tough period for markets, always going to be a tough period for risky asset markets, especially when that comes against a backdrop where, you know, growth is still robust. We expect it to be robust mm -hmm. in the first half of next year, but slowing the reopening boost from uh, from 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 you know the, the COVID restrictions is going to fade over the course of 2022. So it makes for a pretty challenging backdrop with the best part of the recovery behind us, some elevated valuations. We don't expect a taper tantrum as such. I think you know mm -hmm. central banks have been pretty careful about laying out the path, but it's going to be a challenging period mm -hmm. for 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 risky asset markets as some of this accommodation is withdrawn. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll get back to Kamaksha Trivedi very, very shortly. In the meantime, we also look actually at what's happening with Turkish lira tumbling to a record low on Tuesday, a day after President Erdogan was actually defending his pursuit of lower interest rates to boost economic growth and job creation. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the lira. We'll have plenty more on emerging markets. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg.
Well, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Early edition, a lot of the focus, of course, is on Turkish lira falling to a record low against the dollar past 12, a day after President Erdogan defended his pursuit of lower interest rates. Now, the focus firmly on Turkish lira after we have this unconventional policy, which uh, President Erdogan really doubled down on. So this is uh, the picture as we speak. Once it touched uh, 12, it's now at 1216. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on the Turkish lira with Kamakshia Traveda. He's from Goldman Sachs. will be really interested to have a stake on what happens now and whether, um, as the president thinks, whether it's unconventional or not, it will spur inflation or whether actually it's a disaster waiting to happen. Now, coming up, we also talk about oil. OPEC Plus warns it's considering adjusting output plans if the U.S. and other nations proceed to tap their oil reserves. So we'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Picked again, President Biden sticks with the Fed chair for a second term and elevates Lael Brainard to number two. Biden's continuity call makes Fed hike bets intensify. Will markets price in a full quarter point rate rise into the June meeting? And OPEC Plus warns it may reconsider planned output increases if the U.S. and other nations tap their oil reserves. Well, India says it plans to sell five million barrels from its stockpile. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the focus firmly on a couple of things. First, it's uh, that dovish bet out of the Fed. Uh, we had some encouraging PMI figures overall in Europe, but still, it's inflationary pressures that are kind of the concern out there, and that Treasuries are dropping on the back of it. So global stocks falling to a three-week low. It's also dragging some of these U.S. indices futures and Treasuries with them. Again, traders pruned bets for a dovish for longer Federal Reserve after the renomination of Jay Powell as its chair. The other couple of stories that we're watching out for is crude oil and the possible release of those strategic reserves. 78.99 is for Brent. And then Turkish lira past $12. And of course, it's uh, the most, uh, well, the weakest lira that we've seen in quite a long time. And you can see it's continuing to weaken. Now let's bring back Kamaksha Trevedi, co-head of global effects interest rates at Goldman Sachs International. Kamaksha, thank you so much for sticking around. I mean, what happens to Turkish lira at this point? Look, I think uh, you want to stay firmly cautious on the lira. I think this policy mix is unsustainable. Uh, this is a country with very high inflation. You know, interest rates need to be going up, not coming down, in our view. Uh, and the world is different as well. As we have been talking, uh, you know, global monetary policy rates are moving higher. Uh, yes, oil prices have had a bit of a pullback, but those have also been on an upward trend. And in that sort of context, it's really questionable, you know, how long this uh, uh, this policy of easing easing rates in Turkey can continue in the face of such high uh, such high domestic inflation. Yeah. So the policy mix is unsustainable. It probably sows the seeds of its own end, but it can end in ways that are either investor friendly or investor unfriendly. So so we would remain pretty cautious here. So, uh, Kamaksha, how does it, I mean, if it's actually investor friendly, how does it end? And when's a good time to enter back into the country? I mean, look, I think, you know, e even in Turkey, we have seen, uh, you know, windows where, you know, policy mix shift shifts back to a more orthodox stance. Uh, and, you know, it, right. real rates are moved back higher again. At the current juncture, there's no indication that any anything like that is 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 likely to happen. If there was a credible shift in that direction, uh, I think then one can you know this is clearly a currency that is you know cheap on many conventional metrics. It's a uh, it's it it has you know it yields you know very 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 highly, mm -hmm. and so I think you could see investors come back there. But I think that the, the constant erosion of credibility, uh, I think, is beginning to take a take a toll on the in, in the willingness of investors to engage here, mm -hmm. even if there is that shift. So I think we, you know the bar is just higher. Yeah, Kamaksha. Overall, how many you know how, how much interest will there be in emerging markets? I know amongst your top ten themes for 2022, and you also mentioned China and its tolerance to have lower growth. Does that reprice world growth, or where actually, for example, we're importing inflation from? It's a great question, right? I mean, I'd look, I think, you know, globally, I think it's going to be a tough environment for emerging markets. I think it, it already has been, but in some sense, you know, 
growth is slowing, policy is tightening. China, as you mentioned, has moved to a lower gear of growth. Uh, you know, and we're seeing the reemergence of some of the old school emerging market challenges, inflation, political instability, uh, you know, some of those those things, fiscal overreach, uh, you know, and, you know, that's going to make it a challenging environment for EM assets to do well. Uh, I do think on China specifically, however, I think perhaps on the market standpoint, there may be an interesting asymmetry. Yes, it's been a tough year. Yes, we expect growth to slow. But if we get some degree of policy stability and policy clarity in the objective function, uh, I think you know investors may be surprised on the upside there, and I think there will be willingness to sort of take that risk. But I think you know coming back to you know some of the challenges that I was mentioning, and you know Turkey's sort of exhibit yeah. A of some of them, I think there is going to be a higher bar to get investors engaged again. Um, uh, Kamashi, we're also just getting some live pictures there of President Erdogan giving a speech, I imagine it's the parliament, uh, certainly it's a full house in a pretty grandiose setting over in Ankara, so we'll see whether uh, that weakens the Turkish lira further. But Kamashi, where do you see the most interesting bits? We're, we're going to speak to, of course, our Will Kennedy on oil in a second. There was also a couple of assets repricing in Russia. This is on the back of that intelligence report about foreign policy. Will it be driven by foreign policy, some of these emerging markets, or how much volatility could we see in some of them? Volatilities and emerging markets, you know, always come together. So in that sense, there's no, there's no, there's no change there. I mean, we are pretty constructive on oil prices overall, and I think the most, the, the, the key point there is that, you know, apart from what happens to spot oil prices because of some of these news on, on releases, and some of that might already be priced into the oil price fall that you've seen over the last, uh, you know, week or so, I think it's really the longer dated oil prices where we are more constructive. And what we have found in our research is that macro assets price much more of those longer dated oil prices. And so if you actually do see oil prices move up, not just on a spot basis, but further along the curve, that's the kind of thing that should allow oily currencies, oil exports, credits, and so on to start uh, moving higher. So there's, you know, there's definitely opportunities uh, within, within the emerging market space, but the volatility comes with it and a challenging backdrop uh, is, is, is what comes with it as well. Kamaksha, thank you so much. Kamaksha Trevedi there from Goldman Sachs International with some great calls and, of course, looking forward to the themes of 2022. Now, oil prices are under pressure this morning following an announcement from India that they plan to sell 5 million barrels from its strategic reserves with more likely to come. Now, the move comes ahead of a possible announcement by the U.S. about a coordinated release of crude reserves along with Japan and South Korea. Well, joining us to discuss all of this is our Bloomberg Energy and Commodities editor. He's Will Kennedy. First of all, Will, when are we likely to hear if it happens, some, you know, the, the release of these strategic reserves, we wouldn't have seen anything like it actually for quite some time. No, the last time there was any sort of coordinated uh, reserves was during the Libyan civil war in 2011. So this is an unusual event and it's more unusual because it involves China who haven't been part of those efforts in the past. Uh, we expect to hear from Joe Biden at two o'clock. He's speaking on uh, the economy and efforts to lower prices. We assume that's when he may announce the action. Um, we've already heard from uh, officials in India that they're going to take part and re uh, release five million barrels a day. Not a day, sorry, five million barrels. Uh, that's a pretty modest actual release. It's less than India consumes every day. So if that's repeated on the sort of similar proportional scales in other countries, we're not looking at a huge stockpile release. Um, but I think it's significant lies in the fact that you've got uh, four, the world's four largest oil consumers working in concert. Okay, so what, first of all, what does that mean concretely for the, the price of oil? I know, you know, the devil's in the detail. It depends on how much they yeah. release. But we've kind of heard fighting talk then from OPEC+. Plus. Yeah, I do think that a lot of this is probably priced in already. This has been talked about for a number of weeks. The market has clearly been anticipating it. And I think it's one reason why prices have remained fairly subdued uh, since the start of the month when OPEC rebuffed calls from President Biden and other to increase production faster. Now, the market's going to be potentially is going to be back on OPEC+. Plus. They meet on December 2nd. They had been expected to add another 400,000 barrels a day. That's their plan, those monthly increases of 400. We heard from several officials yesterday, though, that action by the US and others means they may have to recalibrate, that their argument is if that consuming countries are going to do this, they may need to think about how quickly they're going to put oil back into the market or risk upsetting prices.
All right, well, thank you so much, Will Kennedy. Uh, it will not be a dull day for Will and his team either today or the week as we await the release of some of these strategic reserves. Now, the UK government is temporarily also uh, taking over the running of gas and electricity supplier Bulb as the energy crunch claims another victim. Now, the move represents the first forced nationalization in the UK since the 2008 banking crisis, and it's the first time the special measure has been used in the energy sector. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison. Rachel, tell us about this pretty, you know, bold and unprecedented move from the government. What's the thinking behind this? And could it have survived in private hands? But the answer is probably no. That's right. The government and the regulator Ofgem decided that it wasn't going to be possible to find a deal for Bulb to give the customers to any other supplier. So they have Bulb has put themselves into the special administration process. So soon an administrator will be appointed and will take on the running of the company. They will be backed by treasury funds, which will then later on be passed on to consumers via bills. So even though the government is backing this administration, the costs still get passed to consumers. And it's quite unusual. As you mentioned, it's never been done in the energy sector before. The government says it has been used in other sectors. But mm. it's because Bulb is so big, they have 1.7 million customers. That's much bigger than the other suppliers we've seen who have failed up to now. And that's why the government's taken this quite extreme measure to try to calm any chaos that may ensue from the collapse of the company. Um, Rachel, how's the wider energy sector actually holding up in general? And Bob was, you know, the, the 21st supplier to go down since August. It's pretty incredible, actually, putting it into context like that. It is, yes. We have now got over 3 million households that have been forced to switch supplier. And some energy suppliers are saying that they expect more to follow. So this was really the big one that everybody was waiting to see what would happen with. And it's a lot of customers to for another company to take on. So we don't know what's going to happen next, how long the government will essentially prop up this administrator to run the, the company or how they will deal with the customers in future. We think they will probably sell or give the customers to other suppliers because the government can't run an energy company forever. Um, but when that will happen, we don't know. A big factor seems to be the cost for consumers and the timing of that. Mm. The government doesn't want to put too much pressure on households at a time when inflation and everything else that um, we've talked about in the past are really hitting households. Rachel, thank you so much. Rachel Morrison there from Bloomberg News. Now, in the meantime, we're getting live pictures out of Ankara, where we're listening or hearing shortly from President Erdogan. He's just giving a speech as the lira is hitting a low versus the U.S. dollar. In fact, the Turkish lira tumbling to a record low on Tuesday. Um, the currency breached, well, past 12 per dollar, which is really a psychological important level. And this is after President Erdogan yesterday defended his pursuit of lower interest rates to boost economic growth and job creation. We'll have plenty more on Turkish Lira shortly. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's focus on sustainable investing. Mirova is an asset manager affiliated with Natixis. It specializes in sustainable investing with a number of funds and 25.9 billion euros in assets under management. Now in September, they launched their first impact private equity fund. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this, some of the key issues in sustainable investing and where we go after COP26 is Mirova chief executive. He's Philippe Zawati. Philippe, thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Surveillance early edition until some of the you know disclosure when it comes to green is mandatory how much more progress will we do from where we are in December or November 2021 yeah, I mean uh, the, the, the fact is that we uh, we have a very very strong trend in terms of, of, of regulation uh, as you know and uh, and more and more we, uh, we we get a lot of data from from companies and and all this is is going uh, to be uh, more and more compulsory, more and more structured. So uh, we had a couple of uh, very interesting announce announcements at, uh, at the COP26, and especially uh, everything which is uh, around what uh, the, the concept of uh, net zero. Uh, and uh, and we uh, we have all, all this concept, uh, which is uh, 
uh, now, uh, uh, I mean, taken by a lot of corporates, but also a lot of uh, investors. And, and, and today, this is a little bit difficult to sometimes to understand what net zero means uh, in, in this context. So uh, this is probably one of the, of the big questions we have ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It's difficult to understand. And it's also, Mr. Zwati, very difficult to see who will put pressure on chief executive to make sure they stick by it. So do you still worry or where do you worry about greenwashing? Some of the you know, sustainable products have also had to be relabeled in Europe. Do you expect that move to take place around the world? Greenwashing is, is, is of course a, a big issue, and uh, uh, and I mean the pressure will come from different di different areas, different steps. I mean regulation is clearly one, uh, and and especially the one of in, in the European Union is uh, is going more more and more uh, important, especially with the uh, new uh, di directives which uh, have been uh, uh, I mean set up uh, the last uh, couple of months, especially the SFDR directive, which uh, now uh, make it compulsory for all the fund managers to explain uh, very concretely how they integrate ESG and to uh, classify their funds in different categories, Article 6, Article 8, Article 9. I mean, I won't, mm -hmm. I won't go into, into the details, but I mean, there are more and more pressure on this. But 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 it, still, uh, all these concepts are very complex. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, when, when, I, when it's come from for, uh, about net zero, for example, I mean, net zero is something very understand, uh, easy to understand at the global level, at the, at, at the, the planet level. It's, it's a little bit difficult to understand at, at a country level, but still we, we can understand what it means. But at the company level and for an investor, it's more and more difficult. And, and, uh, and also uh, the fact that it's a very long term horizon, net zero by, by 2040, 2050. So we have to clarify much more uh, what is it about. And this is the reason why the, the, the yeah. initiative which was taken by Mark Carney at, at, at the COP uh, was very interesting. I mean, the, the, the Glasgow uh, uh, initiative for net zero, which gathers the insurance, banking and insurance and asset management uh, uh, net zero initiative uh, is something uh, very, very, very bold, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is bold. At the same time, we've spoken to a number of big banking executives that, you know, have, have signed this Mark Carnage G fans, but at the same time say, look, the transition will take time, and so they will continue to finance fossil fuel projects. So, Mr. Zawiti, first of all, how do you marry these two, uh, I guess, things that, you know, don't seem to go hand in hand from a philosophical point of view? And at the end of the day, how do you also incentivize or punish other companies that don't sign up to this, you know, climate goal? That's 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 a, a big question, uh, and especially the the, the, the financing of, of fossil fuels. This is also the reason why we are uh, we are clearly in favor of the uh, continuation of what has been done by the European Commission. Uh, so now we have, as you know, a green taxonomy, which uh, clearly explains what is green, what is green investing, uh, and we also need uh, the other part of this, which uh, could be the brown taxonomy, defining exactly uh, where we should, should not invest or we will, will stop to invest. Uh, and, and so this is an ongoing discussion at, at the Euro, uh, European Union level. Uh, so we are pushing a, lo a, a lot uh, on this. It could be a, a very interesting tool in order to incentive uh, all the investors and banks to stop financing uh, fossil fuels. Uh, it would take time because uh, the economy today is 80%, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, led by, by, by fossil fuels. So uh, when you're a bank, when you're a global investor, it's very, di uh, very difficult to move away from all, all, all this uh, current economy. Uh, but if we uh, get some uh, tools, I mean, uh, especially defense on one hand, so uh, the, the industry-led initiative on one hand, and regulation with broad taxonomy on the other hand, then I think we could, we could move forward. Uh, Mr. Zawati, what do you need from policy and actually from public officials in the next six months to make sure that we really drive investments in sustainability and maybe not only on climate change, but also the, S and the G in ESG? Uh, I mean, there, there, we, we, we need uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy to, to continue to, to push. I mean, the, uh, you, uh, as you know, there, there will be the, the uh, presidency, the, the, the France will, be, uh, uh, will take the presidency of the European Union uh, from January the 1st. Uh, so uh, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity uh, also to, to push on this. There is a very strong debate also uh, around uh, um, company reporting and uh, accounting uh, with the announcement which has been made by the, uh, the IFRS Foundation uh, to create the uh, EISSB, uh, International Sustainability Standard Board, which with the objective to set some uh, global standards for uh, um, non-financial uh, reporting from companies, but there is still a very strong debate between the European mm. view on 
facts and the American view on this, and especially the fact that at the European level, we are pushing what we call the double materiality. That means not only the impact of nature and climate on companies, but also the impact of companies on nature and climate. And this is very, very, very important and, uh, and a strong debate that, uh, that will, I mean, yeah. lead the discussion in, in, in coming, coming months. Mr. Zawati, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the Morova Chief Executive, Philippe Zawati. Now, coming up, life after LIBOR is bad over tax-related language is holding up U.S. legislation designed to prevent chaos when LIBOR gets phased out. So we have a full roundup of life after LIBOR shortly. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, spat over tax-related language is holding up key legislation in the U.S. Congress. It's designed to protect trillions of dollars of assets from chaos when global regulators phase out the interest rate benchmark LIBOR. Now, joining us now is Bloomberg's editor of FX and Rates, Will Shaw. He's also a bit of an expert when it comes to LIBOR. So, Will, um, this concerns some $16 trillion, of course, of assets tied to LIBOR, and it's down over a fight at the IRS. IRS tax system. So what exactly is the issue here? Um, just so, thank you very much, Fran. So quickly, by way of background, the Structured Finance Association say there are all these contracts like student loans, business loans, mortgages that can't transition unless there's federal legislation. Now, a solution is underway in the House, but it's met a roadblock over the thorny issue of tax. Now, the draft legislation in its current format would prevent the IRS from recalculating financial firms' tax liabilities mm -hmm. at the moment that their contracts transition. Now, as you can imagine, that is music to the ears of some banks because it means they'll be protected from extra tax. Um, but there's been a pushback from powerful lawmakers in the, the Congressional Ways and Means yep. Committee. Now, they say the Treasury should be left with the discretion right. to regulate and prevent, pr protect against tax avoidance. So, Will, how does this play out? Uh, nobody knows yet. So it's being this bill's being sponsored by a congressman called Brad Sherman, who's a Democrat. Um, he says he's willing to compromise on this issue, but at the same time, he's not optimistic that this will this will pass soon. All right. In terms of timeline, I mean, could it be as soon as in like three months, six months? Could it, could it take longer? I wouldn't bet any money on this <laughs> happening immediately. Um, also, we've got until mid-2023, so there is a certain amount of time. But the Structured Finance Association um, is warning that um, without, this, without this legislation, there's a serious risk of financial disruption. Thank you so much, our Will Shaw there, a Bloomberg FX editor and, well, for FX and rates, and of course, a little bit of an expert when it comes to LIBOR. Now, the Bloomberg short-term bank yield index, also an alternative to SOFR uh, for dollar LIBOR, is administered by a subsidiary of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. So that's a disclaimer from us. We also look at uh, Ankara, where President Erdogan giving a live speech after um, Turkish dollar touched 12. This is a huge psychological level. It also means that the are weakened to its lowest point ever. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. What I think we're all mainly worried about is a Fed policy mistake. And the market is looking at the likelihood that the Fed will increase the rate of tapering and move up the timing of the first rate hike now that Powell has been renominated. I think there are good arguments to be made that we really should be considering how fast we execute the taper. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, November the 23rd. Our top stories today. Joe Biden plays it safe. The president avoids a Senate confirmation fight by nominating Jerome Powell for a second term as chair of the Federal Reserve. The big oil consumers take on OPEC. The U.S. and several other countries are preparing to tap their strategic reserves to try to bring down the price of crude.
And nothing is off the table in Germany. The government's not ruling out any measures, including another lockdown, as it battles a deadly new wave of coronavirus. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Don McKenzie here in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. And Kaylee, the market spent the last uh, 20 hours or so, I suppose, adjusting to the new information around the Fed, around Chair Powell, and factoring in tighter uh, financial conditions to some extent in the United States, but also developing a, a European dimension to that narrative, and that is weighing on European stocks this morning. Yeah, and it's weighing really on stocks across the board, Anna. The market seems to have taken this decision as a hawkish one, leading it to price in the first Fed rate hike in actually June. That led to stocks lower, yields higher in the U.S. yesterday, and that really followed through into the Asian session overnight. Your big underperformance coming from Hong Kong, specifically tech stocks. The Hang Seng Tech Index down about 1.4%. Some of the biggest tech drags were the likes of Tencent and Alibaba. Tencent and Alibaba actually each down more than 2%. Alibaba about three full percentage points, approaching a record low. Part of that is regulatory concern in China, but a large part of that also could just be following U.S. tech lower with those higher yields. Japanese equity markets were closed today, but the yen is trading. Really interesting story. At one point, it crossed dollar yen crossed 115 as you saw that stronger dollar off the back of the tapping of Jerome Powell for a second term. That has reversed some now, though the yen actually stronger against this U.S. dollar by about a tenth of a percent at 114.76. And then iron ore continuing its rebound up about 14 percent in the last three days futures up 4% uh, in the overnight session because there is some speculation that steel output could actually increase next month. As for the picture here in the U.S., similar story to yesterday. The futures are off of session lows. The S&P 500 E-mini is only down less than a tenth of a percent right now, but NASDAQ 100 futures once again are lagging. You are still seeing yields moving up. We're up about a basis point on the 10-year to 163, but you're seeing more movement at the shorter end of the curve. Again, that repricing of rate hike expectations. So as a result, your 530 spread once again is at its uh, narrowest since March of last year. Quick check on Bitcoin, a little bit of a rebound, but not much, up about two tenths of 1% or above $56,000, Tom. Kaylee, you rightly pointed out the sell-off that we've seen in tech globally. The U.S., of course, started this, then China, now Europe. The top sell-off in terms of the sectors is coming from the tech sector. Financials are also down. It's red across the board. Brief and broad selling is what you're seeing at the moment. Down two tenths of percent here in the U.K., despite the fact that basic resources are up on the back of higher iron ore prices. The CAC Cajon in France is lower by seven tenths. The DAX in Germany lower by one percent. Investors looking past more positive data in terms of manufacturing and services from France, Germany and the U.K. and focusing as Anna was saying on some commentary from officials to suggest that the change in terms of the adapting stimulus picture here in Europe is not going to be thrown off by what we're seeing in terms of lockdowns across the continent. In terms of how things are breaking down sector by sector in terms of the assets, let's take a look. Across the Europe stocks is under then, that's the benchmark down 1%. The euro dollar is in focus because it's been under pressure. It's at lows not seen since about June or July of last year, but it is gaining now two tenths of a percent. That is probably tied to the slightly more hawkish, modestly more hawkish commentary we're getting some from some officials uh, within the ECB. The Turkish lira breaking another record, now above 12. This is the first time we've seen that, and that is despite the fact, and in fact, because we've heard from President Erdogan reiterating in Turkey that he wants to see low rates. We've had three cuts since June, despite the fact that inflation is running at close to 20%. So further gains for the dollar versus uh, the Turkish lira. In terms of the oil space, you touched on this, of course, pressure there down more than one and a half percent as we look at that tug of war between OPEC plus and the US administration plus others in terms of that demand for oil. We'll get more on the oil markets in just a moment. And worth noting that Erdogan, President Erdogan's views on the rates environment in Turkey really do matter. And we are hearing from the Turkish president. Uh, he's ruling out the possibility of an early election. So uh, just uh, emphasising why they, why they matter so much. Now a look at what is ahead for us today. President Joe Biden is said to be preparing to announce a release of oil from the nation's strategic petroleum reserves. The move would be an unprecedented effort by major oil consumers to tame prices. Who will go with him then India, Japan, China, all in the mix. Biden will also give a speech on the economy and combating inflation at 2 p.m. at New York time. This as markets digest his latest decision on the next Fed chair. Plus, we'll get November PMI data for the United States at 9.45 a.m. at New York time. As Tom said, a lot of that data has been good coming out of Europe, but it hasn't really affected market sentiments. Manufacturing, or manufacturers, sorry, are facing rising costs, as we know, and those in turn are being passed on to consumers, something that no doubt Jerome Powell will dwell on. Kayleigh. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, he has a tough job ahead for sure, Anna. And speaking of Jerome Powell, of course, he is keeping his job. President Biden nominated him for the Fed chair for another four year term and elevated Lael Brainerd to vice chair. That maintains consistency as the central bank grapples with rising inflation that Anna was talking about and the lingering economic impact of the pandemic. When our country was hemorrhaging jobs last year and there was panic in our financial markets, Jay's steady and decisive leadership helped to stabilize markets and put our economy on track to a robust recovery. American resilience, along with strong policy actions and vaccines that enabled the economy's reopening, cushioned the blows and set the stage for a strong recovery. Today, the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years, carrying the promise of a return to maximum employment. I'm deeply honored that you're entrusting me with this responsibility at a critical time. I'm committed to putting working Americans at the center of my work at the Federal Reserve. This means getting inflation down at a time when people are focused on their jobs and how far their paychecks will go. Now, President Biden's picks may help him avoid a contentious Senate confirmation battle. Jo Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from our D.C. Bureau. So, Joe, maybe less contentious than it could have been. Is there any real yeah. doubt that Powell and Brainerd will get confirmed? No, not really at this point. That was kind of the hard part yesterday, which wasn't very hard for really two very non-controversial picks. Most lawmakers over the weekend saw this coming, and in many cases they were hoping for it. Now, that's not to be confused with some of the other seats that the president likely has yet to fill. Brian Deese, the president's chief economic advisor, told me last night yesterday was about experience and continuity. We just got through inflation week or infrastructure week, I should say. This is continuity week, I guess, with regard to the Fed. There are going to be some holdouts. As we know, it's widely known that Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, is a no vote. She, she reconfirmed that yesterday in a statement that quickly followed these announcements. We heard as well that uh, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon, a Democrat, he's a no vote. Sheldon Whitehouse, a progressive from Rhode Island, said that he was disappointed in the pick, but is also looking to speak further uh, with the two nominees and is hoping that Jay Powell may have a change of heart, for instance, when it comes to climate. But those, those are the progressive Democrats. We kind of knew that would be the case already, and, and it is expected that more moderate Democrats and Republicans will make up for any progressive losses. The whole idea here, to your point, was to avoid a messy confirmation battle. OK, so perhaps they do avoid that, that, that mess, as you say, Joe. What about what we're expecting in the near, the near term from President Biden when he addresses the nation later on today? I was thinking yesterday, how can he do that, talk about inflation, if he hasn't decided who's going to be leading the Federal Reserve? Well, now we know. So what is he going to be saying today? That's right. Well, he'll be speaking from the White House a little bit later on today, uh, afternoon time here in Washington, about a more broad approach. The, in, the, the term inflation is now in the daily talking points in this administration. And as Bloomberg is reporting, that will likely be coupled with an announcement uh, to release some, uh, from, some oil from the, the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The question is how much and over what duration of time and, frankly, what impact it might have beyond the short term. We know that OPEC is threatening to pump more. We know that even with other countries getting involved, the market has possibly baked in a lot of this. But it's a strong announcement from the president. It makes it look like the administration is leaning into this issue that everyone seems to be talking about. Not just energy mm -hmm. prices, specifically gas prices, the most visible form of inflation when you look at polling that okay. people are complaining about this administration. Joe, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew with the latest there. You can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. That is the political angle on what's going on on oil. Let's get to the markets then. Oil is declining ahead of an expected announcement by the U.S. and other major consumers on a release of emergency reserves. The move is designed to tame high fuel prices and rampant inflation. Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's executive editor for Energy and Commodities, joins us on set here in London. What what are we expecting? Good morning to you, Well, What are we expecting from America, from China, from India, from Japan and all the others? Uh, morning, Anna. I think we expect some kind of coordinated action, as we've been reporting over the last uh, few days. That involves the world's top four oil consumers, importantly, the US, China, uh, Japan and India. And we heard from Indian officials this morning. India it expects to announce a modest uh, stockpile release of 5 million barrels a day uh, at some point today, and that oil will come onto the market in the coming weeks. Now, it's not a huge number. It's uh, less than India consumes in one single day. So I think the action here is largely symbolic. We await the details from Biden later today, and then what China and Japan 
decide to do. Um, but the real question that traders are focusing on now is how does OPEC Plus respond? Mm -hmm. They meet on next week on December the 2nd. They had been expected to continue with these monthly 400,000 barrel a day hikes. Uh, that's now in the balance. Interesting to see JP Morgan putting out a note, Kalanovich saying that oil is remarkably cheap. That will probably play in uh, to the hands of OPEC Plus as they consider their response. Can they look through this if it is just symbolism? Uh, yes, I mean, the cheap comment is actually very interesting. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that everyone said uh, they need to do this to get gas prices down, as Joe was talking about how, what a hot political issue that is. But $75, $80 is not especially expensive by historical standards. Sure, it's a lot more than last year, but the Obama administration went years at $100 oil without doing this. So I think it just shows how sensitive it is. But to your point, Tom, it means that OPEC can say, really? Is this really a crisis? We think the oil mm -hmm. market looks in good shape and is recovering nicely. OK, we will continue to watch this story as you and the team will as well. Will, thank you very much indeed as ever. Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's executive editor for Energy and Commodities. OK, let's switch focus to what's happening in Germany, where Health Minister Jens Spahn reiterated that he cannot rule out any measures, including, including another lockdown. This is, as the country reports, a record number of COVID cases. He issued a stark warning to the unvaccinated. Probably by the end of winter, almost everyone in Germany, it might be cynical to say, will be either vaccinated, cured, or dead. But that really is the case. This is very possible with the extremely infectious Delta variant. OK, let's get more with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo on the ground uh, in Berlin for us. Maria, the German government uh, really upping the rhetoric. That soundbite still rings in my ears in terms of the starkness. Just speaking truth to what is happening, arguably, uh, is it working? Yeah, and Tom, who can blame you? It's not often that we hear from a health finance minister say essentially, or a health minister, excuse me, say essentially it comes down to get the vaccine, get your vaccination, or you face a winter that could be uh, potentially deadly. Now, the message coming out of the German government is very severe. At times, you could even argue this is a brutal message that is being passed on to people. And essentially, the goal here is to tell the population that's not had the vaccine, this is now very serious. Coronavirus is a crisis is as serious as it's ever been. This is your final warning. It is your final chance to get the vaccine. Now, the problem on the ground, uh, Tom, if you look at the breakdown of the data that we have this week, a lot of the vaccinations that we're seeing on the ground respond to booster shots. These are people that already had their vaccination and now they want to get boosted ahead of the winter, but it's not first time vaccinations. And that is the problem. Mm. The German government is having a real headache in terms of narrowing this gap. It's the first time vaccinations that is a real problem but again the challenge is that a lot of these people they could have the vaccine there's many doses now for everyone in Germany the problem is they simply don't want to get it they don't believe in the vaccine and they also believe the government should not have the say on yeah. a person's life the question is now whether Germany would feel the need to instinct a mandate to say from now on this is not a personal choice this is really a government obligation you have to get it done OK, so we'll watch the government reaction, the German government reaction to this latest wave of COVID then, Maria. Uh, we're also trying to tie this into what this means for other policymakers and the ECB in particular. We've heard hawkish lines really coming from the ECB's Villeroy and Schnabel overnight. And then Klaas Knott talking to our colleague Francine just this morning, also stressing to us that the ECB stimulus will be dialed back. There is still a lot of uncertainty about sort of the size and the stringency of uh, the lockdowns that will uh, await us. I don't think uh, myself that it will have an impact on our intention to wind down the uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. Class cannot there from the ECB. So, Maria, despite the virus resurgence, the ECB is setting a course for normalization of policy. Yeah, and it's that interview with uh, Francine Lacroix that really got the line that everyone is, is waiting for, that clarification as to whether or not the PEP program would be coming to an end in March. If you remember until now, uh, the narrative coming from the European Central Bank is that this was an emergency QE. The moment the health emergency was over, it was off the way, then it was time to end it. Essentially, it was that clear. And he's repeating that message that what we're seeing in Austria, what we're seeing potentially in Germany, and again, the health minister does not exclude that we could see regional lockdowns in the biggest economy in the euro area would preclude the uh, not an ending of the PEP program. The Dutch central banker is very clear. He doesn't see a connection between the two of them.
All right, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo reporting from Berlin. Now let's get back to the U.S. markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading. Zoom Video reported after the bell last night. Revenue forecast topped expectations, but it's not adding as many large customers. We're in the waning days maybe of the pandemic, or at least people aren't working from home as much, so that could weigh on growth in the future, and that stock is down about 9 percentage points. Another stock that's down is Aurora Innovation, a self-driving car startup. It was up 71% last week, fell 12% yesterday, and down about 6.4% this morning. So maybe retail traders not favoring that stock so much anymore. Maybe instead they're favoring favoring eye specimen. This is a $62 million market cap company, but was up 80% yesterday and up another 100% in early hours this morning, Anna. Yeah, not bad for a technology-driven company on two days where we're seeing technology under pressure. Coming up on this program then, a faster taper for the Fed, part of our interview with the Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic. And we'll discuss the market reaction to Powell's renomination with Amundi CIO Pascal Blanc. Plus, U.S. politics and Biden's challenges ahead with Julie Norman of UCL. This is Bloomberg. I definitely think it's it's appropriate for us to be talking about the pace of tapering and being open to a faster one. Uh, we're going to see some more data between now and when we have to make that decision or have those conversations. And that'll really guide us, I think, in, in having a, a perspective on what the appropriate pace is. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic speaking exclusively with Bloomberg following the reappointment or renomination of Chairman Jerome Powell. We're joined now by Christina Kino, who helps lead Bloomberg's markets coverage. So, Christine, this was taken as a hawkish decision. We're getting more hawkish commentary, stronger dollar, higher yields off the back of it. Do any of those moves look overdone for now? Well, you know, Kaylee, I think this is really just the beginning, you know, because I think up until we got confirmation of Powell's renomination, it was kind of uh, people were starting to price this in, but it was almost kind of uh, the lid has been taken off of markets um, expectations when it comes to uh, Fed rate hikes into 2022. Just before I came on, I was looking at the charts and, you know, we were looking at two um, rate hikes for the Fed in 2022. And now markets are starting to price the possibility of a third one. This is exactly what we saw happen in the UK, and now we're seeing that kind of flowing through a uh, similar situation in the Fed as well. Christine, is this really a case of pricing in Powell, somebody that we know very well, or is this just pricing out uncertainty? I think that's exactly it, Anna. Now that markets know who the Fed chair is going to be for the foreseeable future, now they're starting to think, okay, you know, it's it's an old hand, right? It's the guy that we've known for quite some time, and they've kind of started thinking about uh, the next steps here, right? Which is how the Fed is going to exit its extraordinary policy and start thinking about rate hikes down the line. Is the ECB taking baby steps towards the Fed with this commentary we're getting from, from officials that we've been speaking to around what happens with the PEPP program, that special bond purchase program that some had thought may be possibly extended after March? Yeah, you know, Tom, I think it's been a bit of mixed messaging from the ECB over the last few weeks. What you've seen from them is really a bit of pushback on the rate bets front, for sure. Mm. But I think now what we're seeing is kind of a re-emphasis on the um, bond purchasing program. And I think that's what they're trying to do is to return focus to that and emphasize that they are also in the process of normalization, perhaps not on the rate hikes front, as we're seeing in the Fed and the BOE, mm -hmm. but certainly on that path as well. Yeah, we've heard a few voices then from the ECB just overnight being, if not hawkish, a little less dovish. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Christine Aquino with a look at the markets. Remember, you can get uh, market analysis from the Markets Live team. MLI Vigo is the function on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now let's get your first word news update. President Biden reportedly is considering whether to send American military advisors to Ukraine. According to broadcaster CNN, the U.S. is also looking into sending more weapons to Ukraine, including handheld anti-aircraft missiles. Russian forces on the border of Ukraine pose the threat of invasion. 
The latest coronavirus wave in the United States is taking its toll on some states' intensive care units. Several parts of the country are seeing outbreaks that are as bad as ever. In 15 states, patients with confirmed or suspected COVID are taking up more ICU beds than a year earlier. Michigan now has the highest coronavirus case rate per capita in the United States. Coming up on this program, back to the markets, Pascal Blanc, Amundi's CIO, will get his response to the re-nomination of Jerome Powell at the Fed. That and a broader conversation about where rates head next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. And Tom, really interesting to look at how far we've come this morning on the European equity session. It's been a tough ride. We were down mm. by more than 1% on some of these major markets across Europe. Yes, COVID fears, but also fears about uh, whether it'll be premature or timely, tightening of financial conditions across the Eurozone and in the United States. That's been weighing on technology stocks globally. Interesting to see that that theme running in Europe, even though we don't have a great deal of a technology sector to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. The call from analysts is normally get exposed to Europe if you want that exposure to cyclicals and value. Is this overdone? A 2% loss across the tech sector. We're wearing up, of course, higher yields in the US, as you say, and modest. And you caveated it correctly. Modest, more hawkish commentary from some of these officials linked to the ECB. I look down the list, though, there's a lot of semiconductor makers, the likes of uh, ASML and mm. ST Micro. So they're taking a hit on the back of both the higher rates, but also these concerns about lockdown. Maybe uh, this will impact some of the factories as well. Something to watch. Yeah, the higher rates narrative then certainly uh, uh, lurking and uh, threatening to once again derail any strength, any risk appetite on Wall Street, Kaylee. Uh, we see that E-minis and Dow futures fairly flat, but Nasdaq futures still under pressure. Yeah, it's that tech underperformance that you and Tom were just talking about. Let's get into the specifics of what those numbers look like at this point in the session. As you both alluded to, we are off of the lows, but still tech is under pressure in the stock 600. That tech index that, yes, is smaller than here in the U.S. is still down pretty sharply, down about two percentage points when it comes to that index. And Nasdaq 100 futures at this point in time down by about a quarter of one percent. That is as we see yields continue continuing to move up and more so on the shorter end of the curve as the market pulls forward bets on a Fed rate hike. Now that uh, Jerome Powell has been renominated to serve as chairman for another four years, they think liftoff is coming in June and that is leading the two year yield higher. Another four and a half basis points today after a seven basis point move yesterday. Right now that two year yield sitting around 63 basis points, which is the highest going back to early March of last year. And of course, speaking of the inflation conversation, President Biden looking to take action on higher gas prices, specifically potentially today at 2 p.m. Eastern time in that speech about the economy announcing the release of reserves from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And as a result, oil down 1.3% when it comes to WTI futures right now trading at 75.75 a barrel. And let's get a check on some of those richly valued names pressured by higher yields and under pressure in pre-market trading. Rivian and Lucid Group, which of course have seen monster rallies in recent weeks, falling for a second day. Rivian for its part down about 2.5%. NVIDIA down 1.5% as well. Again, all of these off of the lows of the pre-market session, but still in negative territory, including Apple down about two tenths of 1%. So it does look like it still could be a down day for big tech come the opening bell in about four hours time, Anna. Yeah, Nasdaq futures on the back foot. Now back to one of our top stories, and it's linked to that market response then, Kaylee. Investors and economists digesting President Biden's decision on Fed leadership. This is a good team at uh, the Fed. This is sort of the dream team. I think this is a don't rock the boat move. There certainly is not going to be any conflict on monetary policy. This is the, the central case that the markets expected. To not reappoint uh, Powell would have been quite negative for the markets. The announcement today is going to give the market more confidence to move ahead with the pricing of rate hikes for next year. It's not my expectation that we'll get a faster taper. We still have the Fed on wait and see. They stick with the current pace and then hike once you get to the to the end of that. We're at a point in the economy where stability is really important. Continuity. Total continuity. Continuity is a very good thing to have at the central bank and that's what we're going to have. So continuity is uh, is the way that it's being received by markets. To some extent, Pascal Blanc, Amundi Group Chief Investments Officer, is with us. And um, Pascal, uh, very good to speak to you. I want to ask you about that balance between continuity and pricing in something new, because markets do seem to have responded with, with quite a lot of aggression around the idea that we are going to see, what, a faster taper, faster rate hikes from the United States. How do you view the market action since we got that renomination of Powell? 
I think there is a sense of uh, continuity, and, uh, and this is a positive uh, for sure. The question is the continuity of what, actually. Uh, there is a temptation to think that we will see them embarking on some kind of uh, normalization path, tapering, and then hikes. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not my view, actually. I think, uh, seen from my window, what I'm seeing is uh, central banks, most of them in the West, erring on the benign neglect side of the equation for various uh, reasons, an asymmetrical stance relative to growth and inflation, probably uh, some kind of uh, fiscal dominance, probably a uh, sort of uh, financial repression uh, framework. And uh, what I'm seeing is uh, central banks uh, behaving uh, as if they were trying to keep real interest rates firmly in negative territories, capping nominal rates while uh, hiding behind the narrative of temporary inflation. Uh, okay. and, this, uh, and this is, uh, in my view, uh, what's going on. OK, so, so we've seen quite a bit of reaction in the front end of the Treasury curve as a result of Powell's renomination and, 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 and removal of uncertainty, perhaps, also. But we're up at 0.6% now on the two-year. So from what you've said, Pascal, do you think that the markets are overreacting? Are the markets now pricing in too much tightening of policy, either around the taper or rate hikes from the Fed? What I think is the following. They will hear on the benign neglect side of things actually, for various reasons in relation to uh, uh, real interest rates, in, uh, in, in my view. And uh, at the end of the day, actually, they will lose control uh, on the curve. So what I've got in mind, actually, is less of a classical, uh, I would say, uh, correction driven by the uh, hold reaction function of central banks and more something like a bond revolt in the, the markets at some huh. point. They okay. are already uh, behind the curve. So, Pascal, how do you protect yourself? What's your hedge in this environment? Uh, actually, uh, uh, actually, there are various ways to, uh, to look at it. Uh, on the bond side, for sure, we are uh, erring on the short duration side of, uh, of, uh, of the strategy, for sure, uh, because we've got collectively a big problem of duration. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is back on the equity side. For sure, this is the uh, there is th there is no alternative for sure uh, from a strategic standpoint. Having said that, it's critical to be uh, protected against the likely bursting of the tech bubble at some point. It's not a if; it's a when, and the when is when real interest rates uh, pick up, and to uh, maintain uh, to stick. Uh, to the uh, value case on the equity side of the market. OK, Pascal, the bursting of the tech bubble is an if, not a when. What does that mean for your exposure to tech? Do you have no exposure to tech at this point? Actually, um, uh, 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 I wouldn't say that we've got no exposure, actually. Uh, and there are various ways to look at the tech sector, actually. but. Uh, uh, the situation as of today reminds me of the uh, April 99, actually. Uh, it is clear to me that we are faced with, uh, with a bubble. Uh, this bubble has been extended due to uh, the fact, as I just mentioned, that real interest rates are uh, firmly in negative territories and, uh, and, and central banks are, are acting uh, uh, to support uh, negative uh, real interest rates. Uh, for me, at some point, we will see bond yields nominal uh, picking up, either through higher real interest rates and or higher inflationary expectations. And okay. this will remove, remove uh, the big support uh, for the tech sector. Right. That's my question, Pascal, is if a tech bubble bursts, that doesn't just affect the technology sector. That is the bulk of the market here in the U.S. Or what are the implications more broadly for risk assets? I think one way or the other, actually, uh, uh, we will have to go through a reordering of risk premium on both uh, the bond and the equity side of the market, adapting to a new regime of, uh, in particular, higher inflation and a higher volatility in inflation or higher uncertainty 
uh, relative to, uh, to, uh, to inflation. The obsession about relative values, that is uh, everything relative to interest rates, basically, and this idea that interest rates will stay low forever. This uh, idea will go, actually. We will see at some point markets refocusing on absolute valuations. And absolute valuations okay. are uh, what they are today, red hot. Pascal, thank you very much. Uh, interesting conversation. Pascal Blanc joining us there from Amundi. Coming up next, we'll discuss Biden's Fed nominees with Julie Norman, University College London, lecturer in politics and international relations. We'll get to the US geopolitical agenda. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, J.P. Morgan Chief U.S. Economist Michael Faroli. That's at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards and Tom McKenzie in London. Well, President Biden has dodged the risk of a Senate confirmation fight over the Federal Reserve. His decision to reappoint Jerome Powell for another four-year term as chairman of the central bank drew support from both Democrats and Republicans. Some progressive senators opposed a second term for Powell, though. Julie Norman, lecturer in politics and international relations at University College London, joins us now for more. Julie, I want to point to a note I got from Terry Haynes over at Pangea Policy yesterday. Yesterday. And he said Powell's only one part of the puzzle piece. You have Brainerd and two new governors that likely foreshadow tougher bank regulation and a monetary policy shift leftward. Do you think that Biden may throw a bone to the progressives like Elizabeth Warren with the remaining seats? Well, Kayla, I think Biden was very smart with this move. He quite literally banked on the, the term of the day, continuity and stability here with Powell. But he also recognized some of the concerns of the left, especially concerns around banking regula regulations, also climate change, also issues of diversity. So we saw that in the Brader nomination, and we can expect some pressure on Biden for the other uh, governors and posts that he, he nominates for the Fed. But right now, we see Biden really trying to stay the course as much as possible during a time of real economic uh, questioning and uncertainty. Well, and a time where he's trying to make sure his entire economic agenda is pushed through Congress. We have the Build Back Better plan passed in the House. Does this confirmation kind of question maybe weigh more heavily on that bill's passage in the Senate? Well, one thing that was good for Biden in this is that it'll have an easy confirmation in the Senate. And so that will help clear up the agenda for the Build Back Better plan to go through, as well as for other things that are on the Senate's agenda going into December. But the big question for Biden is going to be how he spins his larger spending uh, priorities with, uh, with rising inflation in this coming year. So whoever he has in the Fed, a lot's going to come back to Biden on what happens with inflation and how that links back to his policies. Julie, do we have a sense of how things are playing out in terms of, we know the polling numbers are bad for Biden, but what it is when it comes to changing that dynamic? We've got, of course, a spending bill. Does, is that enough for Biden at this, this point as we look ahead to the midterms? Well, Tom, Democrats are certainly hoping that's the case. Yeah. I think for uh, the larger voting public, the infrastructure bill was a big win for Biden. It showed that he could get uh, bipartisan legislation through when he needed to, and especially on issues that relate to a broader swath of the public. For the spending bill, for the Build Back Better plan, a lot of those policy points are very popular when people are polled on them, but it's going to be hard for Democrats to spin that against uh, what Republicans are, going to, or Republicans are going to be hoping to spin that just as a big government spend. What would you put at this point as the number one geopolitical risk for the Biden administration? Uh, for geopolitical risk right now, for the administration, China is obviously the big uh, thing in the background. But increasingly these days, we're hearing a lot of uh, tensions around Russia and especially Ukraine. So those two issues are things that, that Biden's going to have to be balancing going forward. Mm, yeah, speaking of thinking about the Ukraine story, I mean, we've been covering this for a few weeks now. And, and in some senses, troop buildup uh, on, on Russian borders is something that you just get used to hearing about in European media. Is this being taken more seriously by the Biden administration then? Do they think they've got more this time? Well, and it is. Right now, there's a buildup of expect about 100,000 Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. That's a quite high level, even by, by relative standards. And American intel is just reading these signs as very similar to what we've seen in the past. They're not saying there's going to be an invasion in Ukraine, but they're saying all the pieces are in place if Putin was to make that move, and they want to be prepared to respond in kind. So we see the U.S. and NATO also starting to ramp up some of their military activity 
activities and trying to be better prepared just in case Russia takes that step. Okay, and as Tom was saying, this is just one of a number of geopolitical challenges that, that the United States is facing, of course, and thinking about China, relationships there. Interesting, we're waiting for any news around the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the US, and there have been a lot of conversations with allies and with China on this subject, with India, with Japan, and with China. And, and they're cooperating there, just as they cooperated at COP26 to, to make an announcement. Is that a dynamic we need to focus on? Absolutely, Anna. This is something I'm following today, too. We expect in Biden's comments today, he'll refer to opening the petroleum reserve. And again, that hasn't been a solo effort. It's been in coordination with several other states, and so interestingly, including China as well. As you noted, this is right on the back of COP26 and also on uh, Biden and President Xi's meeting last week. So I think we saw all of this as indications of the U.S. and China cooperating if and when they can, even while those larger tensions are there in the background. Which illustrates the point, and it's something that the Biden administration, at least members of the Biden administration, have said they want to be able to work with China on some issues uh, that, as other issues of tension uh, continue. Uh, arguably, uh, China shooting itself in the foot in the last few weeks with the treatment of Peng Shui and the IOC now getting involved. It is, how much damage has been caused to China's international image beyond what's already happened overseas as a result of this, or is it just another notch? I think this is just layering on. We've already seen the criticism of Beijing starting in the lead up to the Olympics in February and the current situation with the IOC and with the apparent disappearance of, of this tennis player are just adding on to these more human rights concerns that are always not only under the surface but starting to rise above the surface with China. Okay, th we, we're nearly at Thanksgiving in the United States and so attention in terms of to the more domestic perhaps. Uh, let me ask you then about the key message that President Biden wants to get across today because he's going to be speaking about the economy Yes, recovering, but part of the price of that has been really high inflation, multi-decade high inflation in the United States. How can he turn that into a positive? Well, that's going to be the big challenge for Biden today, and really to try and reassure Americans that this inflation that they're seeing is transitory, which is still what the administration's position is. Obviously, many disagree with that, but trying to at least calm the fear so that the fear of inflation itself doesn't simply drive it more. Okay, thanks very much, Julie. Really good to speak to you. Julie Norman, University College London, lecturer in politics and international relations. Uh, the perfect voice to talk about uh, a host of U.S. themes this morning. And coming up on Balance of Power, more on U.S. politics with Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas. That is at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. if you're in London. This is Bloomberg. This is sort of the dream team. Uh, Chair Powell clearly uh, is a force for stability and good sense in monetary policy. Leo Brainerd, someone I've known for over 30 years, extremely talented person. I think together you're going to see uh, an even even better alliance and, and combination. I, again, just think uh, the combination is very powerful. Peter Orzag there, Lazard's head of financial advisory, discussing President Biden's picks for Fed chair and vice chair. Of course, we've had now 24 hours almost to di uh, digest that information. Tom Keane, I think you were on air when we got that news, co-anchor of Bloomberg yeah. Surveillance, and he joins us now. So you've had some little, a, a little bit of time to reflect on it. I've been transfixed in the early European hours by the continuing move higher in two-year yields. Your focus, though, 24 hours later, more in the middle of the curve. Well, you know, you look at the Bloomberg terminal, there's all sorts of tea leaves there to give you an indication of this historic announcement. It was wonderful, particularly, Anna, to speak to Vice Chairman Alan Blinder of Princeton uh, yesterday of the tumult around him and Alan Greenspan years ago, and certainly not the case uh, now. This seemed to be far more uh, collegial. Uh, what, what I looked at of the given tea leaves is the belly of the curve, which is five to seven years, just out to the benchmark, the 10-year yield. This is something we usually don't look at, the five-year as compared to the 10-year yield, with the red circle being the beginning of the pandemic. And we're almost full circle back here. This is a higher five-year yield relative to a lower 10-year yield. And it speaks of some normality of getting back to where we were in January and February. I think it's fairly constructive. And Tom, a lot of this is down to that 
commentary, the momentum that seems to be building around a faster move on, on the taper. How, how, how prescient is that? How much is that feeding through, do we think, yeah. to the decision making? Well, I, I don't play the parlor game. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. Mm. I, I, I just don't do it. It goes back, I think, to the it's true tumult of 1994, but probably back earlier uh, than that. My answer is, is all central banks, except maybe Turkey, uh, looks at data. They mm. are data dependent, and this is a Fed with Brainerd, mm. with Clarida exiting, with uh, Powell that will be hugely data dependent. Guess what? Tomorrow is more important with all that data we see in America uh, and the holiday length and work week. Yeah, so we are going to get a lot of data, aren't we, ahead of that ahead of that holiday, uh, Tom, as you point out, lots of it coming tomorrow. I just wonder where we've got to on the forward guidance uh, conversation, though, because this, this concept has been around in central banking now for, for many years, and it's, it's shaping up differently in the US, here in Europe. And here in Europe, there seems to be a lot of sceptical voices now saying they're not sure we really need this anymore or the markets should be quite as addicted to it as they are. What are your thoughts? My, my answer is you've nailed it. The market is addicted to it. It's a parlor game. It's fun to play. Uh, you can play at home. Uh, and mm -hmm. the bottom line is people like doing it. I'm, again, going to look at the data. Uh, some of the data yesterday was actually quite constructive of a buoyant America. What I will say, Anna Edwards, is, is the distance here of the, of the uh, pros is, is immense. The, the, the distance here on 2022 and even out to 23 mm. is extraordinary. Yeah, the importance of focusing on that data to get clarity or at least some steer as to the policy response. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Thank you, of course. Now, a look at what else we are watching. I know Tom is focused on this story as well, the oil construct and what's happening, uh, Anna, between OPEC Plus and some of the US and its allies, but also mm. China as well. India coming out saying they're going to release some of their reserves, but it was being pointed out by our energy team, it accounts for just one day's worth of consumption of oil within that country. Yeah, absolutely. So the question being, you know, if this is not going to have a big impact on prices, why is it being done? A lot of symbolism yeah. in there, of course. We were hearing that from our oil team a little bit earlier on. I'm watching what's going on in Europe, both from a stocks and also a yields perspective. We've seen a little bit of a, of a read across the Atlantic from the US uh, Treasury curve into the European uh, day, and yields have been pushing higher a little bit, but also because of comments coming through from the ECB. And these perhaps in the context, in the aftermath of what we heard from Powell and co, uh, and, the, and the Biden administration and the Fed, all of that very dominant. Uh, so perhaps we're not, we haven't given it quite as much emphasis as it, as it deserved, this ECB narrative that's been developing over the last 24 hours or so. A few more, I hesitate to call them more hawkish voices, Tom, but slightly less dovish voices then, even in the context of the COVID fight that we're seeing so, here in Something Europe. of a modest shift, and there had been expectation from some that maybe that March special programme of bond purchases mm. that was set to end was going to be adapted in and as a result, what's happening on the ground in Europe, now they're pushing back on that, saying it still holds for March. But, of course, that December meeting, all important as well, Anna. Yeah, they're setting a course for normalisation yeah. of the ECB, despite everything that's going on with COVID-19 right now, which in itself is pretty interesting. More Bloomberg surveillance is ahead with Tom Keane and the team. We'll hear from Eric Robertson of Standard Chartered and Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, among plenty of other voices during Bloomberg surveillance. This is Bloomberg.